Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Hagen, and this is Next in Sales, a Next Level podcast. I'm so excited to introduce you guys to my guest today. I have Amanda Freak, uh with me, and she is the CRO at Altruistic. Amanda, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor and pleasure. Awesome. I'm super excited for our guests to get to know you and for me to get to know you a little bit better as well. Um, I'd love if you could give our viewers just a little bit of background on yourself, how you got to where you are and what you're kind of doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll try to keep it kind of as brief as possible. So uh, (laughs) engineer by education, third generation engineer. Um, and I went into the power sector in college. Uh, so mm-hmm. I did energy work with electric utilities, started in California and have followed the sunshine now into Arizona. Um, mm-hmm. So the first half of my career was really spent working for and with utilities. In the second half, I crossed over into the dark side of sales um, <laughs> and have been doing that ever since with both vendors, um, engineering firms. And now I'm at Altruistic. Um, leading our kind of revenue operations there. And we are um, a technology consulting firm. We really Mm -hmm. have two sides of our business. One is truly kind of that consulting firm. We, you know, strategize, design, build, and implement any kind of technology um, ranging from software development up through artificial intelligence, which is really more where our sweet spot is in that kind of data science space. Um, And then the other side of our business, which is very exciting, is we have an investment arm. So we find incredible companies that are usually coming to us for tech help. Um, And if we really believe in them, we may end up becoming one of their investors. So it's a really wonderful place to be. We see a lot of amazing innovation. And um, yeah, I'm just so great to be here today. Awesome. Well, and guys, not only is she a CRO, but she and her family are also digital nomads and they literally travel the country (laughs) in a motorhome, which I just think is the most amazing thing and so super cool. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, and that's why like, I'm so blurry in the video, if you're watching the video right now, um, is because I turned my background on because you'd see our messy motorhome. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, it was a silver lining of COVID for us. My husband was the CEO of a wonderful assisted living company. But as you can imagine, during COVID, that was extremely stressful and hard on everyone involved. Um, and so I had the crazy yeah. idea of like, let's have you quit your job. Like I've run the numbers, we'll be okay. We'll buy a motorhome and travel with our then four year old son. So Uh, We do go home at the end of this summer so he can start first grade uh, back in Tucson, Arizona. But I would say to anyone listening who thinks, you know, making a huge jump for your family to put your happiness first, uh, this is your sign from the universe to do it because it was the best thing we've ever done. That's amazing. Well, let's dive right in. So, um, you know, obviously you've been in sales for a while. You know, Mm -hmm. what is something you wish that you had known at the beginning of your sales career and when and how did you learn that? That is a great question. Um, And I am going to dedicate this answer to uh, a man named Jason Plain. Um, And he was my boss at um, Eaton Corporation when I was there. But before that, he was actually the salesperson who called on me while working at a utility. And we became fast friends um, and just loved working together. And one day he told me, he's like, Amanda, like you're one of the utility people that could cross the fence. Like you should go into sales. I'm like, you're insane. I can't sell anything. (laughs) Like I am not a salesperson. I'm an engineer. You know, I engineer things. He goes, Amanda, I watch you sell every single day. You're just not getting purchase orders for it. Right. You're getting buy-in from your colleagues. You're getting projects approved internally. It's like that's selling because now all you have to do is collect money for it. I was like, Oh, that's amazing. And so he, he was then two jobs later, he ended up being my boss, but um, he was really the one who kind of opened my eyes to sales is not just about closing purchase orders and money, right? It's all yeah. relationship based. And so, um, yeah, I'm very grateful to him because my career took a huge shift after that conversation. And um, I wish I would have known sooner. That's pretty amazing. Well, and I mean, out of everyone that I've talked to, at least so far on these podcasts, I mean, it just, it keeps coming back to sales is not about selling people on Mm -hmm. a product. It's about selling them on the idea that you are going to do everything that you can to make their experience better and make their lives better. And the trust that you have built between whether it be you and uh, somebody you're selling to or somebody on your sales team. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's funny that, you know, you look at salespeople and you can kind of tell like, 
I can kind of tell there's two versions, right? There's kind of the very yeah. aggressive, which could be extremely successful, successful yeah. talk today. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're uh, pushy might be too strong of a word, but you know, they're, they're getting things done and they've got good numbers. Don't get me wrong. Um, right. But then there's the other side that where we become best friends with every single one of our clients and customers. And, you know, we know everything about their families and it's just, it's a very different way of selling. And I think you have to like be self-aware of don't try to be the other kind if you're not, because it's going to feel right. forced every day. Like, so, yeah. you know, go with the flow. Well, and even from, from a perspective of, you know, obviously I work for a recruiting agency and I get to work with tons of different hiring managers and it's about building the relationship with them so that they know I'm not, I'm not just trying to get somebody placed there. I'm trying to actually help you find somebody that's going to make your team level up and, and in the process, I want to get to know you. I want to know what you do on the weekends. I want to know what your hobbies are. And um, I just think that that's like the most important thing really when it comes to business. Um, so Definitely. kind of segueing into a little bit of a different area. What yeah. do you think is the most creative way that you have ever closed a deal? I have been thinking on this question. Uh, since <laughs> you were so kind enough to prepare me for it. Um, and I, I'm going to share actually a pretty funny story also from when I was working at Eaton as a sales professional there. Um, awesome. one of my clients was an electric utility here in Arizona and we had a large order for capacitor controllers, which, I mean, this is like nerdy stuff, but it's the, something that goes on a power pole, right? That controls a piece of equipment. Gotcha. Um, and it was worth a lot. It was a big sale. Like it was worth a lot of money. Um, but part right. of the issue was they didn't have the internal expertise to get the things programmed and installed and like the logistics of it, right? Mm. So I could sell them all the equipment, but then it would fall on its face. To your point, like the sale does not end when they sign the PO, right? There's a lot of stuff behind the scenes to make sure they're successful. Mm -hmm. So a couple of colleagues and I, of mine uh, and I had this harebrained idea of, we have emergency trailers that we use for like responding to natural disasters and things like through a different, totally different department of Eaton. Okay. And we said, we just had one come back and get cleaned. What if we brought that to this utility we deployed some of our services guys, like basically full time, and they could come in and we could ship the controllers here. They could program them on site. They could train the folks of the utility like, and we'll, we'll create this little ecosystem on site, which is like, was not heard of at that point. <laughs> um, and I have a background in labor relations. So electric utilities, you know, use a lot of unionized workforce and there's some interesting things there. And so mm -hmm. I approached the manager of the project. And I said, hey, listen, this is gonna sound crazy. Call number one labor relations. Call number two, head of the project. I think we can push this through. And we did. Yeah. And I think a couple weeks later, we brought this like 30 foot trailer up to their parking lot. They just removed it. And this is years ago. They just removed it, I think maybe a year ago. Um, yeah. And we, I mean, some of our like favorite pictures of my career are me and the leadership team, like in front of this trailer that closed this huge deal. But it was, it was awesome because we not only yeah. delivered the product they needed, but they got the training, the education, like the sale turned into, you know, something that really moved their business forward. And we were so blessed to be a part of it. Um, yeah. All because of this like 30 foot trailer. So it was, it was, I was a little nervous in that first phone call, but yeah, it was crazy and it worked. And I think, you know, to that point is you hear crazy stories in sales like that all the time where you kind of pull in a hair and you know, and <laughs> I think like, I always say the worst they can say is no. Right? right. The worst thing they're going to do is call you crazy and like they'll still answer your phone call next day. So like always just ask. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty incredible. You were able to like really help them overhaul their entire system. I mean, <laughs> I, I that's really going the extra mile in sales if I've ever heard a story of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was pretty funny. Like it's that story. I still have the pictures on my phone. It's um, it's uh, it's left a legacy, let's say. Well, I just, I love that you, you were in a position where you're like, I really want to make this work for you. So mm -hmm. how can I do that? And being able to put yourself in a position to go out on a limb for, for, for a client that you may not know super, super well, but, you know, putting yourself out there to build that relationship and help them get to where they need to be. And that's really like, again, the importance mm -hmm. of relationship building and sales. Yeah. Um, it's all about that extra mile. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've talked to a ton of people in sales as a sales recruiter, um, and 
especially a lot of people who are at the beginning of their sales careers, AEs, uh, who are brand new or in SDRs. And so many of them have told me, you know, the most difficult part about getting started in sales is the amount of rejection you face. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be your advice to those who are really struggling to overcome that? That's, that's a really important topic, I think, especially for those who come into sales and they kind of fall into it like I did, right? And you didn't kind yeah. of grow up thinking, I want to be a salesperson. It's just for whatever reason, you found yourself there. Um, you know, and I think it's it's interesting, especially depending on what kind of sales you're doing. So when mm -hmm. I started my career in sales, I was more in um, really large corporations where there was an existing customer base. Um, and right. so you had some wins to kind of keep you going through it. Um, in coming to Altruistic, which was really interesting, is that we're a startup, right? So- right. I'm reaching out a lot more than I would have had to in previous jobs. And I, I honestly, I get told no a lot more just because I'm, I'm asking more questions. Right. And right. I think the, what I always say is go for no, right? Like don't go for yes, go for no, because if they yeah. don't want to work with you, you want to move on quickly and you don't want to yeah. sit there and waste time. Oh, they're really nice. They want another call. Da, 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 da. Like you're wasting your time. You're wasting their time. Everybody's going to lose. Um, you know, it's a, it's finding that balance, but I think don't ever take it personally, first of all, yeah. right. It's sales is personal, but it's not. Um, right. and I think really just go for no, like I even did this silly online training years ago when I first got into <laughs> sales and I can't even remember like the name of the online course, but she shipped you a hundred gold stars and your goal of the program was to get a hundred no's, but each no was a gold star. And it was sort of like to flip your mentality on getting a no. I love that. And so it's, I will say it honestly helps because it kind of gamifies it and makes it a little mm -hmm. less like, ouch, they don't like me, you know? Right. Well, and it, I think it lends itself to the idea of you want to find what the, um, like whatever the roadblocks or whatever the hesitations are going to be up front. And the sooner that you figure those out, the sooner you can say, okay, either this is going to be, uh, a conversation for a later date and we need to bring in more people or it's a no and we can move, we can both move on. Yes. A hundred percent. And it, I mean, a no is never really a no, right? I mean, unless they're like, please don't call me again, like block my number, which I right. thankfully never had happen. Um, but to your point, like it's, it's not right now, right? It's not the perfect fit. Yeah. I mean, I'm in data science, artificial intelligence, like this is advanced technology. Not everyone's ready for kind of this next step. And there's been a lot of budgets cut because of like how the economic situation is. So I think just being mindful of what you're selling into and the relationships and yeah. politics that are around you will really help you kind of prioritize and understand what's up. Regard, like regardless of the topic that, that we're discussing, timing is everything. Everything. It's everything. It's funny because I actually just had this conversation this morning <laughs> about cold emails, right? And it, it like they're gross, yeah. but we all do it, right? I mean, it's how else you're going to reach a bunch of people. Right. And I was laughing because I get cold emails, of course, as a sales leader for, you know, I automated SDRs. You. <laughs> yeah, you cool. Yeah, exactly. Like I get them every day, all day. And I put them all into like a resources for another day folder. Like that's literally what right. it's called. But if I'm having a day where I'm like, oh, I could really use like a killer SDR and you happen to hit my inbox that day, you're going to get a call, right? And yeah. so I think it's, understanding that there is a little bit of divine timing in a lot of this. Um, and just to be mindful of that, like I used to, I used to really be afraid of cold calling and cold emails because the rejection numbers are so much higher. Um, but yeah. now again, it's go for the no. And I mean, if you call a thousand people and you get one hit, depending on what you're celebrate selling, that that be worth it. Yeah. You celebrate that hit a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and, you know, obviously throughout your time as a sales leader, I, you've done a ton of hiring. And so one of the things that I always love to try to understand is, you know, when you're interviewing, what's one of your favorite questions to ask? And what does the answer to that question tell you? Yeah, I love this one. And I think there's, there's a lot of ways that people judge salespeople. I mean, clearly numbers do say a yeah. lot. Um and you, and you want somebody who can perform. Um, but I think you really have to go beyond the numbers, which is why my favorite question is, what would your current clients say about you? Like, what would they describe you as? Yeah. And there's, and there's two kind of things I'm looking for in that. One, their answer says a lot about how they think about themselves 
which is mm -hmm. even more important, right? It's step yeah. one of a person. Um, and then number two, it really is like some self-awareness of like, you know, why are you leaving your current job is, you know, do you not like your clients? Do they not like you? Um, and so I really like to hear, I like to hear that, right? Because it tells me what's important to them. Like if you asked me that, I'd say my clients would say like, I'm always available to go the extra mile. Like yeah. Amanda has become my easy button, right? That's always been kind of my slogan. It's like, I want to be your easy button. Like, don't ever hesitate to call me. Um, and, you know, I'm portraying kind of this availability and help and, and that and service, right? Where somebody else might say, you know, oh, I always get it done. I'm always on time. Like they're more of like a type right. A kind of situation. So it just gives you an idea of kind of where their head's at, where they might be culturally within their sales journey, journey which is important. Um, yeah. But yeah, I like, I like to get that perspective. I really, I think that's really interesting because, you know, for me, I immediately go to the relational. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. we have a great time on our meetings. Uh, I know um, what they built in, what uh, this hiring manager and his daughter built in their Minecraft world over the weekend. Yeah. I have another hiring manager who likes to uh, drive around in a Ford Raptor, like, and, and fix up cars with his buddies. So, but then there's also the other side of it where it's like, somebody's going to be much more process driven mm -hmm. and is going to be more about like, oh, well, um, I always deliver on time or I'm mm -hmm. always early. I, I'll get back to you within 24 hours. It's just like really about mindset and where your head's at and how your sales process works. Yeah. And I mean, you have to remember, like if you're interviewing, I mean, you're selling yourself. Yeah. Right. And the interviewer is selling their company. And so that's also an interesting dynamic to see. Like it's an how, interesting how dance. are they, right? <laughs> yes. Like, how are they selling you? Like, are they picking up on what you're saying? Are they, you know, are they using some good techniques? So I think it's the entire conversation is very telling. Um, and it's, I think it's definitely been really interesting in the last couple of years, just because the job market, I mean, you know, better than anyone recruiting, it's <laughs> like wacko out there. Um, it is. So it's, I mean, I think we, we put up a, a role for a project manager at the end of last year. I think we mm -hmm. got like 600 and something applicants overnight. Um, it's so it's insane. It's insane. And it's, it's hard to know, you know, who's going to be the right fit. I mean, it's a little bit of a crystal ball, but I think really focusing on not just numbers, but a cultural fit is mm -hmm. really important, especially in times when, you know, your market might be going a little wonky. The economics of the situation might be a little weird. Like if, when you go into yes. high stress, like people's true colors come out. Um, and so you just want to make sure it's going to be something you're willing, you know, someone you're willing to go through the trenches with. Uh, yeah, I, I love that you say that. That's one of the number one things that I know that like me and my team look for when, when we're working with a client and trying to bring in new talent is, are you going to be a culture fit? Like, why this company? Why is this company exciting to you? Why is this team going to be the next best thing for you? Because if it's not, then why are we all wasting our time? Uh, absolutely. And I can tell you, like, being in the startup world is a grind, right? We help a lot of startups, I would say we are a startup. Um, and there's a lot of days where you're working a lot of hours, and it's, you know, you're, you're feeling heavy. But I will say the team that we have is absolutely next level. Our CEO is amazing, Rob. Um, and I really believe in what we're doing. And for yeah. me, like, I would never be able to sell something that I didn't actually believe in where I can't fall asleep at night because I'm like, oh, I should have reached out to that person because they would have thought so highly of this, right? Or, you know, you're still excited. And I think if, if you're taking a job because it's a job, like I, I get that there might be financial situations where you, you got to sell something you don't love. Um, right. But man, when you find that company you align with, it, it absolutely doesn't feel like selling anymore, right? You're just right. talking to somebody about your best friend. like. Right, exactly. And so you've kind of touched on some of these already, but, you know, as a hiring manager, what do you think the biggest pain points that people are seeing in quality hiring for sales today? Man, that's a good one. I think just sheer volume of applicants is yeah. is really hard, right? Um, and it, I mean, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of reasons why somebody might get skipped over in that first round. Right. And yep. a resume only says so much. And, um, you know, on in our world and in, in the tech world and data professionals, which is who, you know, fuels our business, we actually develop proprietary technology to help us do skills assessments. Right. Yep. And we're actually taking that to market now because you say, oh, I need a data scientist. It's like saying I need a salesperson. There's four thousand different kinds. 
right? How do you know right. they're going to have the right skill set, the right soft skills, all the things? Um, so I think, you know, partnering, if you don't have the time to do it yourself, you need to partner with someone who does, right? Yep. Because I'm, I'm telling you right now, if I had to put up like a regional sales manager job, I would have to hire help because there's yeah. no way I'm going to go through those 600 applications and make any kind of a, you know, informed decision on who's getting cut besides your resume is not pretty. Right. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's awful, but it's the truth. And I think really using, if you're going to use tools, there's a lot of like fancy resume scanners out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I did a lot of research on kind of the recruitment world for this, this tool that we built. Um, and it's, and I would actually love to ask you this question, but I asked okay. <laughs> over 50 recruiters and this was for data science. So a little different, but I said, right. how, how much do you trust a resume? And then 99% uh, of them said, can I say zero on a scale yeah. of one to 10? I would also say like zero to one. I yeah. think, I think it's so hard to represent who you are on a piece of paper mm -hmm. because the reality is you can put whatever you want on that piece of paper, but you show up to an interview and you can't fake that. No, you can't. And I think, now, especially, like, you need to be able to differentiate yourself, especially yeah. in sales, right? Everybody's getting 4,000 LinkedIn messages. Everybody's getting 4,000 emails. And, like, if you're applying for a job, I want to know that you have a little it factor, yeah. right? Like, go get a free account on Vidyard and put a video in the email. It's like, right? I'm, I'm like, so excited that you're hitting quota every every quarter yeah. but but what else like what about yes. you is really going to add to the team i don't need just another star player i want somebody passionate i want somebody excited yes. there's just so much more than what you can put on a resume um yeah. and i think you've kind of already talked about this i mean working with agencies when do you feel like that's warranted i mean for me it's all about time versus value right yeah. so is it a valuable use of my time to spend, you know, hours and hours reading through that first list of resumes? Absolutely not. Right. Right. Um, and I think if, if you've got the staff to do it, God bless you. Um, I don't. Right. And so yes. I would definitely turn to outside help. I think if you're hiring for positions that really need like that it factor, you know, or just that extra or set of very eyes. niche. Yes, like the niche, you know, they, they need to do sales, but they're going to be like for us, like artificial intelligence, you got to under you got to know the lingo, you know, yep. those times having somebody help you, I think is really valuable. I mean, I've worked with some just stellar recruiters, you know, in over the years, sort of some bad yeah. ones, too, for sure. Um, but I think finding the right help and finding someone you can trust um, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking of, of one right now. Her name's Layla. She's awesome. Um, but she, she got in it. She knew me, right? Like she got yeah. me. And so she would know she like, Hey, okay, this guy, you're going to love this guy. Ah, I think we're going to be on the fence, but da, 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 da. you know, like, so she really took the time to get to know what you were yes. really looking for, not just what the job description was, but what was going to work well for you. Yes. Which is huge. And I think even like just as much as resumes lie, so do job descriptions, right? I yes. mean, jo job descriptions are like a couple people in a silo writing a bunch of stuff they think you're going to do. And right. I, I would say like the basics of the job descriptions in my life have been on point, but there is mm -hmm. so much beyond what's on that paper that is important for that candidate. And that's, again, why I think having somebody who can take the time to explain that, you know, because I know I've been approached for roles and they're like, oh, you know, would you be a good fit for this CRO role here or whatever? Right. And I have that, right? And then you talk to the recruiter and they're like, oh, that's not a deal breaker. I go, well, it looks like a deal breaker on the job description. So those, I think those kinds of things are just really important to, to have that help in your corner. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love what you said about job descriptions. I think that, you know, a job is an ever evolving thing. So mm -hmm. it's really hard, just like with a resume, it's so hard to put into just a few sentences that sounds super professional, what you're going to be doing day to day. And, and so, you know, as a, especially as a recruiter, sometimes, you know, we've got people who will be just like, just send me a job description. And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I really would love to just explain to you this job because I feel like you're, you're not really going to get the, the, 
the it factor behind yeah. why this is so exciting. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I love that you brought that up. And I think, you know, retention has become a much bigger deal in the last few years, right? Like yeah. our generation is not our parents. And, you know, we're not staying at companies for 35 years. And, you know, if you look at my resume, I've, I've jumped around a lot. Um, and it's never been, you know, because I, I wanted to hop or I, you know, I, I'm non-committal or whatever else. It's because really amazing opportunities knocked on my door and I couldn't say no. Right. Yeah. And I think understanding that that's the market and just, you know, living in this digital world, people can work for companies all over the globe. Right. And um, yeah. I think as a company, it's not just about the candidate being a great candidate anymore. The company needs to be a really great company and you have to put yourself out there in a way that's going to attract the kind of candidates you want. Um, And I think that, you know, understanding that, you know, millennials, Gen Zers, like we, we want to do something we care about, right? Like, is your company sustainable? Are you trying to, you know, are you, are you diverse? Are you working on things to make the world a better place? Like a lot of it sounds a little cliche, but it really does matter. Because at the end it of the day, all trickles like, down. it all trickles down. And I think it's, it's so important to understand that like, if you're, if your employees are doing work that they believe is meaningful, they will not leave you. Yes. Right. They want to be challenged. They want to feel like they're making a difference. And so I think that is really, you're seeing a lot of companies learn that lesson in a really hard way right now. Yes. Because like, Again, the job market is just nuts. <laughs> it is absolutely wild, wild right now. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, do you have any last piece of advice for our viewers? I mean, always ask the question. I always say you're one conversation away from changing your entire life. Um, and I think just from, because I am in sales, uh, if you do anything in tech, you have any cool ideas in tech, if you're a startup in tech, um, reach out to me because I talk to startups all day. We talk to enterprises all day. Um, and we just, we really love supporting innovation that is going to do girl good in the world. Um, yeah. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'll never turn down a phone call from someone who wants to make a difference. So, um, and if you need someone to read over your resume and make sure it's not too boring, I'm happy to do that too. <laughs> Me too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably actually way better at it than I am, but. Oh, I don't know about that, but thank you so much again, Amanda. It's been such a joy having you on and to all of our viewers. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and if you like what Amanda and I have to say, then please like comment, subscribe, and tune in next time to next in sales.